Bonjour à tous les gamers. Alors aujourd'hui on se retrouve sur Jesso Gaming pour la suite du bonus de Never Alone avec les, euh, les vidéos euh, qu'on avait pu faire au, au bonus. Voilà. The scaredest I've ever been. I was 12 years old. We floated out on a piece of ice uh, while we were duck hunting. It was a bluebird day, just clear blue skies. And there was three of us, myself, my brother, and my dad. Next thing you know, we see this dark, dark shadow on the ice. Uh, we look and it goes behind us. So we, we all jumped up startled and uh, my dad, he started running. We got back to the ridge there. The, uh, the ice had fractured, cracked and broke off and we were floating away. We were, we were drifting. <laughs> It was close enough to where my dad would have made it. He stopped and he thought about throwing us across and if one of us was on the other side, we would be split up. So he stopped and he just so happened to have a, a cell phone on him. 911 didn't pick up. <laughs> That's the worst feeling in the world right there. 911 did not pick up. So he left a, a message because they record their calls. Once he had relayed that information, his cell phone died. That was the scariest moment I've ever had in my life. We were floating away and I thought we were left for dead. Uh, he kept calm during this situation. Uh, he's bringing out everything positive in this case. You know, I'm crying, my brother's freaking out. It went from clear blue to dense, dense fog. Within a couple hours, we heard the chopper flying around, so they must have gotten our message. We thought we were saved, and then the chopper sound went away. So we lit some of the sled on fire. It's plastic. We thought black smoke in the fog would create some kind of marker. Chopper pilot uh, had mentioned uh, when we got rescued, you could see a glow in the fog and he slowed down there and sure enough, as soon as he slowed down, uh, we got within visual. That was definitely the scariest moment of my life, was floating away and not knowing what the outcome was going to be. Alors franchement, on m'aurait dit que, euh, que à cet endroit-là, les portables auraient marché, qu'il y aurait des antennes relais pour portables. Je pense que je n'y aurais pas forcément cru. Et forcément, il faut des portables ultra résistant parce que là-bas je pense pas que c'est des moins 2 ou moins 3 je pense que c'est plus moins 50 euh, moins 40 donc euh, portable très solide là-bas et en plus une antenne relais bon j'ai un peu de mal à y croire je vous avoue mais bon pourquoi pas pourquoi pas y a pas de problème we are very much aware of the climate change and it's been for many years even before climatologists were noticing this change in it, we're already saying, Sila Alanoktok, our climate is changing. If the heat is going the way it is right now, for us it's going to be pretty bad. Different birds are coming, and they're coming earlier, and sometimes rain is more than what we want, because when there's more rain, we know it's going to melt the permafrost. In my time as a young quail, when I was nine years old, we're hunting from ice that was about 25 feet thick. And there was giant icebergs already floating, coming by. That was the first signs of a changing climate. Ice that never broke before was now moving. Now, here it is 50 years later, we're hunting quail from ice that's 18 inches thick. There's no more thick ice. It's creating a malfunction in our whaling season, is, is what it is. And actually, more than that, all seasons in general. I think we are more scientists than more people will realize. We have more knowledge of those things than people will ever know. Eh oui, faut prendre conscience de ça. Prendre conscience de... Du, du réchauffement climatique. Euh, une fillette et son anuque, euh, donc ça on est bloqué. Bon, je sais pas pourquoi. Comme celui-là, toute chose est vivante. Dommage. Mm -hmm. 
in you know Arctic Alaska, hunting is a really important part of life. It's not just about going and shooting something; it's about going and putting food on the table. But more importantly, you know, subsistence hunting isn't just about the insular family unit; it's about feeding the whole community. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about subsistence hunting in Alaska is that people go out and they'll go get you know fish, or they'll get a caribou, and they'll get you know seals and whales and one of the first things they'll do is they'll say, oh, I need to take this to the elders. This isn't just about one individual surviving or one family surviving, it's about the whole community. We didn't just go out and kill and put, and put in the freezer. It's like a ritual that I learned from my parents. It's, it's all about relationship. I don't know, I, I think there's, there, there's a lot of camaraderie involved. Uh, and, and, and just being out on the land or being out on the ocean, it's like getting back in tune. I'd rather be out there. To me, once I go out there, it's the world that I learn from. I suppose it's not much of I think most central to the ideology of the Inupiat is, is the idea of sharing. Being able to feed the community, feed others. That's why we hunt, you know, in the old days, it's, that's, that's what you needed to survive, you know. And sharing is important because it's how the community survives together collectively. We just give. That's how I grew up. That's the way I'm always going to be because of who we are. We always think about other people first. If if our people didn't share in you know in the old days, we wouldn't have survived in this harsh you know climate environment. So, excuse me, it's not easy to live in these, in this, how do I say, in this milieu, really, with temperatures like this, and really isolated from everything. It's not easy to live in at all. And King Island, and in those uh, three islands are the stepping stones to get to America. So King Island is this absolutely beautiful place off the coast of Alaska, and if you can imagine being on this really kind of rocky island that kind of shoots up from the water to these cliffs. And then all of a sudden you see these stilts and then you look up and there are these houses. They were built on the cliff up high because of the ice. Being an island in the Bering Sea, you have ice that's being pushed by the winds onto the island. So it's going to pile up uh, 50, 60 feet high. Structures are still there today and uh, people have returned to King Island. It's a growing community as the people return back to their island. When I was young, my mom, whenever the Northern Lights came out, she just whistle. <laughs> Boy, they come alive. Just keep whistling and that aurora will just like, you know, you can almost hear it. And then she explained to me uh, a little bit later that those are children, and children who've passed away when they're children. You don't want to draw them in too much, you know, is what she said, because then they could play football with your head, play Eskimo football, and that's what they want to do. They're always playing with children up there. Don't play out without your hood on. If you had, don't have your hood on, the Aurora person is going to come down and chop your head off and play ball with your head. It wasn't like they were trying to do bad, you know, or it was like a scary story or anything like that. It was just, that's what, that's how it was, that's what it was. Sortez couvert. <laughs> In the month of November, there's no sun. So during that dark time, we travel 
by the light of the moon. It was quite different. Everything was silver and black. Toward the horizon, we could see where caribou are because their body heat flowing upward and we could see it glowing in the moonlight against a dark horizon where there's no stars. If somebody yelled, you couldn't know who yelled from where the sound came from, but specifically where that cloud of their breath went up and it, it glowed in the moonlight. So that was a good time to travel. It was very surrealistic. And so things that were dark objects look very close and white objects look very far. Ça, je savais qu'il y avait un, un mois dans la nuit, euh, bah, je ne sais pas trop où, mais euh, qu'ils n'avaient pas du tout de, de soleil. Ça doit être quand même assez bizarre, je pense. We are taught that there's no hierarchy. It's not everything else, and then man, you know, <laughs> humans on top, and they're separate from everything. We're taught that everything is, is equal, and that all the animals have a human form, or can be seen in a human form. And so they have just as much or more intelligence. You know, in fact, have a lot to teach people. And so that's how these transformations can happen. It's if the animal wants you to see it in its human form. There's a story where a man comes up to an ice hole and then there realizes there's there's another man in his parka that's that's got stuck in the net, you know, and is just stuck like that. Oh, can you can you let me out? Please help me, you know. And so then he lets the man out, but then realizes that was actually a, a seal. That was a seal man. And just because that seal wanted that help, that seal allowed itself to be seen in human form. Quand même voir l'esprit très euh, très ouvert. We have our dimi, the body, which returns to Nuna, the earth, and we have Atif, who is our name, that has been passed down to us over the generations. The spirit of our Atif lives on, so long as man remembers that name. It would be hard to describe what happens after death. The feeling is that when our Anirinik returns to Sila, then that may be reborn if the name is passed on to a new child who can then retain some of the memories of the original name. And so it's not uncommon for grown-ups or adults to meet a child who has the same name maybe as their grandmother and say, hi, Akka, which means grandma, hi, Appa, or hi, little mom, or hi, little dad, because it's a traditional belief that their soul you know, is continuing on. Humans are renewed and replenished over time, just like our plants. Every year, flowers are born and bloom and they die. Next year, they are born again. The recurring type of character in Anupiak stories is the manslayer. And the manslayer is kind of this bad guy and I think really what's at risk when the manslayer comes into story is the livelihood of individuals and the whole community and so the manslayer is really used as a way to say don't act only for yourself always hold the community in your heart often time in these stories there is one person that will stand up and and what this humble person will represent who faces that manslayer is a return to order a return to true living in the community and it just takes that one person 
It could just be that one person that can help to change everything. Because everyone wants to live a good life. Everyone wants to have a good community. Des fois, les prédateurs sont plus proches qu'on ne croit. Prédire la météo, bah, je ne l'ai pas non plus. Je ne sais pas pourquoi, comme ça, j'en ai loupé. Euh... C'est assez bizarre, je pense. Et la petite fin. With the story of Kunuk Sayuka, told by Robert Cleveland, it's just a, it's just a masterwork. It's a well-known story among the Inupiaq people, and in our case, of producing a video game that really reflects indigenous heritage, it's it captures the imagination, and it's something that you have a very specific kind of task to do. If there's a blizzard. You know, and it is just a non-stop blizzard that is overpowering the people. And there's one man that wants to figure it out. And in our case of the story, it's a girl that wants to find the source of that blizzard. The blizzard man, it's like that is the physical embodiment of an element of nature. And so there's a person that needs to go up and take away that that adds that's chipping away that that snow in that community the person least expected is the one who stands up and makes the difference humility is but something that we value and where that comes from is the idea that you are not the biggest thing in the world and when you live in an extreme environment like where the inuit reside you are at the whim of the environment of the climate of the animals you can be as prepared as you can you know by learning from your elders that you know you're not the biggest force in the world voilà donc voilà pour les 21 euh... En fait, il y a une vidéo en tout euh, bonus. Hein. Bon, je trouve ça assez dommage quand même qu'il m'en manque, mais bon, c'est pas grave, hein. tant pis. Je vais pas refaire le jeu pour quatre, enfin euh, pour trois vidéos. Euh, en espérant que, bah, que franchement, le bonus vous a plu. Moi, personnellement, bah, ça m'a plu euh, vraiment beaucoup. Euh, bah voilà, c'est pas, ça a rien à voir avec du, du vidéo ou, de la, ou du gameplay ou autre, mais hein, ça fait quand même partie de, euh, voilà, vous voyez, hein, ça fait quand même partie euh, de Never Alone. Hein. Donc euh, je me devais de les présenter. Euh, moi personnellement, euh, j'aime ai, beaucoup en fait, on va dire, voilà, apprendre des choses comme ça sur des tribus, sur, euh, sur des légendes aussi, sur euh, un peu de choses comme ça. Donc bah dites-moi ce que vous pensez, hein, tout simplement, d'un peu de tout, euh, tout ce qu'on a vu, hein, que ce soit les téléphones portables, euh, en plein milieu, euh, en plein milieu du, euh, de, de, de l'article, soit par rapport aux légendes... Euh, qu'on a pu voir, je sais plus où, mais bref, voilà. Sur l'homme euh, sur l'homme blizzard ou autre. Hein, voilà. N'hésitez pas à me dire ce que vous pensez. Bon, bah voilà, les gamers, je vais vous laisser là. Et puis, bah, on clôture ensemble bah, le, le let's play. Euh, enfin, le let's play, non. La playlist de Never Alone. Voilà, en espérant que cette playlist vous a plu. Euh, moi, personnellement, j'ai passé beaucoup de temps euh, à. Enfin, j'ai passé beaucoup de temps à la faire et, euh, et euh, à apprécier, on va dire ça comme ça. Donc voilà, j'espère que ça m'a partagé. Allez, à bientôt les gamers. N'hésitez pas à liker, partager et aimer. Allez, à bientôt.